know I've talked about the gifts that black children have. Gifts second to none. We were given the best gifts in the world. We were the first people God ever even created. Teach us. All right. All right. Yes, sir. We have minds that are second to none. Yes. Yet somehow we've been deceived into thinking that to use them is to be non-black. Yes. That means our consciousness has been created by someone else. Consciousness then is a power. It's a type of power. How much power consciousness has depends upon its level and its organizational state and its functional state. That's why other people who want to use other people seek to control their what? Their consciousness. Because one thing about consciousness, the state of consciousness you, you're in determines what you're capable of doing or not doing. If you're in one level of consciousness, you can do one thing. If you're in another level of consciousness, you can do another. One of the greatest problems we have to solve in trying to achieve our fullest development is knowing how to control our consciousness in such a way that we can bring to a task or a problem or something and the level of consciousness appropriate to it. You say, how to match level of consciousness, organization of consciousness with problem, with circumstance, you see, and how to be able to do that through our will. That's a very difficult task to achieve. In other words then, when we know our body needs rest, it cannot get rest if we remain in a state a wakeful consciousness can it? Not in the deepest sense. It cannot receive the restoration and rebuild itself as long as it's highly what? Aroused. So what do we do? We put ourselves or let ourselves do what? Go into the consciousness of what? Sleep. You see? And once we go into that consciousness, the body begins its healing process and reparative process, you see and recreating process and we awaken energized and healed and with the clarity of consciousness that permits us to function and you can't get that kind of healing and clarity of consciousness and restfulness and reparation unless you go into the consciousness of what sleep but while you're asleep you can't do what certain other things so there are things you can do when you're awake and alert and in that state of consciousness that you can't do when you're asleep. And there are things you can do when you're asleep that you can't do when you're in another state of consciousness. And there are many levels of consciousness, you see. And if we could recognize them and know what behaviors are related to them, we will be able to regulate our behavior in a very appropriate way by regulating the levels of consciousness related and correlated with those behaviors. And therefore, you see, consciousness enables us to achieve certain ends. It makes it possible for us to accomplish certain things. And when you are able to achieve certain ends and accomplish certain things, that means you are exercising power. Because power involves the ability to achieve certain ends against resistance. The ability to to act in terms of one's own interests. Depending on the state of consciousness you're in, you will relate not only to yourself in a very sort of way, but you will relate to others in different sorts of ways. If you're in a state of consciousness that you call anger, your relationship to that same person when you were in love changes, doesn't it? Your language changes, your body changes, everything changes when that state of consciousness is in possession. When you're feeling lovely and all of this, the language changes, the body changes, and other things happen. You see? Therefore, people who want to control other people seek to control their consciousness. Consciousness is to a good degree a social product. 
meaning that it is created as a result of the nature of the type of social interactions we have with other people to a good extent. And when you look then at the consciousness of black people in America and of African people in the world, the consciousness that we exhibit to a good degree at this point reflects the nature of the interaction we have with European people. And one of the major objectives of European people is to manipulate and control the consciousness of African people and through their manipulation and control of the consciousness of African people, divert that power which ordinarily would be the power of African consciousness to their own use and increase their prosperity and power thereby. <coughs> the relationship then of the European man to the African man to a good extent is a relationship of Count Dracula to his victim. Mm. Oh, Trying to integrate and merge with your enemies is not going to solve your problems. Dang. Okay. Trying to integrate and merge with your enemies is not going to solve our problems. And it is not going to happen. As a matter of fact, it is a fantasy that has kept us from taking care of business for far too long. The idea that we're going to one day be one with, our, one with these people that we're going to merge into invisibly with these white folks. Even if that were possible, we should question our motives for wanting to do so. Why would we want to merge with the world's greatest criminals and thieves, with the people who have the worst values in the worst and who have the worst values the world has ever known? It's amazing to hear some of your parents saying to our children, we want to be just like them. It is a joke. Power and consciousness. We're going to pursue African-centered consciousness, personality, and culture as instruments of power. Ultimately, this is what the whole struggle is about, one of power, not one of loving one another and all the things we hear. Largely, the problems we are confronted with today as African people in America flow from our powerlessness or our inappropriate use of power. We've been made to think that even, excuse me, we've been made to think that to even talk about and think about of power is sinful, that to pursue it is immoral and wrong. But one cannot exist without power. Without power, there is no life. A battery without power is dead. You need power to act, to behave in the world, to deal with the world. Consequently, we must interpret what we are about in terms of power. We have the power. Brothers and sisters, we have the possibilities. We just need to reorganize ourselves, reorganize our consciousness, our personality, and our culture, and see them as instruments of power, and use them as instruments of power to transform our situation. Welcome back to On the Shoulders of Giants. Happy Monday. I am Joseph Ward, and we are continuing our reading and review of Dr. Amos Wilson's African Centered Consciousness versus the New World Order, Garveyism in the Age of Globalism. And we are on part two, African Centered Consciousness, Personality, and Culture as Instruments of Power, which starts on page 85. My reading picked up on page 86. Um, the first paragraph in the middle of the first paragraph of page 86. And I continued on to the second paragraph of page 87, which is titled Power and Consciousness. So today we are going to go into consciousness and, and how consciousness is used as a form of power to control. And as I just read, if you don't have power, then you will be dependent upon others who do have the power. And unfortunately, that is the situation that black people in America that we find ourselves in. We are without power. 
and any power that we believe we do have is not true power. We have a um, we are we are in, in proxy to power. So any idea of power that we do have, it's given to us by white supremacists. So that's the proxy power that we have because of the relationship to white supremacy. We have the idea of power, but in actuality, it's not real power because we don't control our lives. We don't control our communities, our well-beings, our societies, our structures, none of that. We don't control it. We are dependent upon those who do control it, i.e. white supremacy. So being able to change our consciousness, change how we see ourselves in relation to the world, as Dr. Amos Wilson talked about. What is the black person's relationship to the world? What is the, what is the African person's relationship to the world? What is the black person in America's relationship to America? And once we fig realize that, figure that out and realize that, we can see why we are in the position that we continue to be in. Our relationship to white supremacy is one of a laborer, one of a subordinate relationship, one of a slave relationship. And that consciousness has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. So it's changing our consciousness from a slave consciousness to a consciousness of an empowered, autonomous people, free people, liberated people, independent people, because we've literally put ourselves in that position, but we've changed our consciousness while we were changing our actual physical situation. So this is what we're getting into. So we're going to dive, dive deep. You know, um, this is this was a, a, a good read. This is a good read about Dr. Amos Wilson. So page 88, second paragraph. Without human consciousness, there is no world. It is the presence of human consciousness that brings meaning into the world. Without consciousness, human beings in this world, in effect, there would be no world. We bring the world into being through our consciousness and through our consciousness create the world we live in. Out of the totality of reality, our consciousness hews a world that fits itself. In other words, the kind of world you exist in reflects the kind of consciousness you have. Notice if you change your consciousness or change your values and orientation, you enter into a new world. You interact with different people, people you didn't even know existed in the world, social situations that you might not have even recognized until you entered into a new level of consciousness. You observe people, for instance, who become addicted to crack or other mind altering substances, now enter into a world where and enter into a whole world of social system that before they became addicted, they hardly noticed. They didn't know what it was all about. They picked up new friends, new relationships, entirely new ways of acting, altogether new purposes in life. They lost old friends, broke with old families. In other words, the addictive consequent, the addictive consciousness brought into brought into the world a new foreground and put other things into the background. And this is true. We know when we come into new realms of knowing, new realms of consciousness, new realms of living and new realms of being, the world around us can change. You go into a new social circle and you start meeting new people, new opportunities that didn't happen before, that you didn't know before, people you didn't know existed before, opportunities that you didn't know existed before. For you, going from poverty to wealth, total mind changes total mindset changes let's put it in that mindset to become wealthy if you are poor to become wealthy your mind state has to change the way you view yourself in the world the way you view your relationship with money the relate the way you view how you can earn money has to change to become wealthy to truly become wealthy, to truly change your situation from poverty to wealth. There has to be a total mindset change. And in conjunction with your mindset changing, your actions and your habits and your lifestyle must change. So that's what Dr. Amos Wilson is getting at. You know, like they say, free your mind and the rest will follow. 
whatever mind state or mindset that you have, your physical world will reflect it. I'm going to say that again. Whatever mindset or mind state that you have, your physical world will reflect that. And not just your physical world around you, it will affect the condition and the even the, the look of your physical body. You ever notice how people who are doing good in life, who are truly doing good in life, who are truly doing good in life, taking care of themselves, they look great. They radiate great energy. And then look at people who are not taking care of themselves. Look at people who don't think they're beautiful, people who don't think they have purpose, who don't believe they have purpose, people who just look down, excuse me, people who look down on themselves. Look at how they carry themselves. Look at the physical appearance. Your mind state affects your physical world, affects the physical world around you and your physical body. Man's consciousness is a creative act and the kind of consciousness one has will determine the kind of world one creates. Consequently, when we look at the world we live in, African people, we must recognize that to a great extent, it is a world of our own creation. It is a world generated by the kind of consciousness that we have permitted to be instilled in us as people. We talk about the white man as having power. Recognize that power ultimately has to do with a relationship between people and between people and that the white man's so-called power is law is to a large degree based on the nature of the relationship he has with the black man. All right. We empower him by the nature of our own behavior and attitudes as a people. He cannot be what he is unless we are what we are. If you continue to behave like a slave, if you continue to behave like a victim, you, be, you continue to behave like a ratchet person, like a hood rat, like the lowest forms of life. Well, your relationship with your with, with your oppressor will never improve. You will always remain a laborer. You will always remain a slave. You will always be subordinate. You will always be on the bottom. Always. We have to see ourselves as better than what we are seeing ourselves as today. We continue to prop the white man up as being empowered over us, as giving him power over us. We do that to the white supremacists. Now, we've put ourselves to, in 2023, in reality, we've put ourselves in a position so destitute that the white supremacists don't even need us the way they used to need us. The labor of black people, as far as the relationship between black people being laborers and whites building wealth off of black labor. It's not as in demand or it's not as needed today in 2023 as it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So we are. We are going to put ourselves at a position to where we are going to be the useless class of people, and it's because of our slave and our victimized mindsets. We'll waste a lot of time trying to transform them when through transforming ourselves, they will be transformed automatically. The power is in our hands. When we stop letting people treat us like trash, they have no choice but to treat us different. You will treat me like a human being. You will treat us like a human being because we're treating ourselves like human beings. Look at the progress we're making. This is, has to be the mindset. Look at the progress we're making. Look at how we hold ourselves, look at how we carry ourselves, look at how we celebrate ourselves, look at how we talk about ourselves, look at how we relate to each other. It's all positive, it's all empowering, it's all designed to make us better. This is the mind state that we have to get to. No matter the conditions around us, I will find a way to become the greatest version of my black self. Even though the United States is bragging about the millions of jobs it is creating, the bulk of those jobs are part-time jobs, low-wage jobs, and jobs that have little or no future. So when people talk about creating jobs, you have to ask what kind of jobs are being created. That is why, of course, the system is not investing in black education. It no longer needs black people to maintain its employment structure. 
The white supremacy system no longer needs black bodies of black employment, black skills for the to, to, to maintain the employment structure. We're not needed. They're replacing us with technology and replacing us with other groups of people, Hispanics, Asians, and so forth. Why continue to keep a failing group of people as second class people when you have two other com uh, competing groups of people willing, ready, and able to surpass them because they're doing better as a whole. You see it bringing in people from outside of the nation to be employed. You see it even in, you see it, you see it is even hiring in the world itself and other nations and other places. Already it had reached the point where it is, where it's need for black males is pretty much saturated and it is literally warehousing us in the jails and the prisons and provoking us to kill each other and destroy each other out here in these streets. Yet we're still organizing the education of our children as if the white man still has jobs waiting for them in the multitudes. That's due to our consciousness, a failing consciousness, a failing mindset. A stubborn consciousness and a stubborn mindset because we don't want to change. We don't want the responsibility of becoming truly free, truly liberated, truly autonomous, truly independent. That comes with responsibility because now you really got to take care of yourself. You really got to take care of yourself. Not being independent, not independent in the sense of a system is still taking care of us, a system is still supporting us, giving us subsidies. That's not independence. And the true independence is I can do what I want because I am funding what I'm doing. We are creating all kinds of jobs and wealth and we must come to understand this we are creating these jobs and yet we are begging for jobs that means that somewhere our consciousness has been impaired we are begging for what we are making already we cannot use our own creation as a source for our own wealth and this is when the, uh, dr wilson was getting into talking about the part of the consciousness that uh enslaved and victimized people have is we only know how to produce for others. We don't understand how to produce for ourselves. So the skill sets and the, and the education and the information that we get, we use it to continue to empower others. We get into other people's schools, we get into other people's business, corporations, institutions, companies, and we make them better. We constantly brag about being the first black person to do this and within a white setting of the first black person to do that within a white setting when that's not helping us. No, the, the Jackie Robinson example. We're praising Jackie Robinson for going to play in the major leagues while the Negro leagues are beginning to decline. That doesn't make sense at all, but it's made sense for white America because it helps to keep up and further what they have going on and it diminishes what we have going on. It's a change of consciousness. So we have developed over the years, we have developed skill sets and we go get education to be a part of white systems. And then complain about us not having what we need for ourselves when we never thought about creating for ourselves. And when we do think about creating for ourselves, it's in a vacuum and we can't really, and we're not resourceful enough to be able to create a system that works for us create a community a true community which is self-sustaining community is self-sustaining we need to become self-sustaining as much as possible so we have to become the greatest individuals so we can become great as a whole if you as a black person who are listening to this if you every day are not working to become better if you still about that bullshit you tripping. You're a part of the problem. You're a part of keeping white supremacy going. Ultimately, the wealth of a people is not in their land. It is in their mind. The wealth of a man is in his mind and his consciousness. The wealth of a man is in his mind and in his consciousness. We continue to see ourselves as only laborers and only 
consumers and producers for others. We will continue to be laborers and consumers and producers for others. The consciousness matters. How you see yourself in relation to the world matters. We see ourselves as depending on Europeans when the reality is the other way around. They depend on us, on our soil and on our people. We have to be backwards in order for this situation to be the way it is. Our reality has to be turned backwards and we have to live in almost a permanent state of deception in order to be used the way we are used. The Japanese must depend on others for their vital resources. Those products they use to create their technology and so forth are taken from the soils of other people and then sold right back to them. Yet they are seen as rich and powerful. And, and, the, and the people whose wealth they take or buy are seen as poor and poverty stricken. Ultimately, then you cannot rob or take wealth from a poor people. You cannot extract wealth from a poverty stricken people. People who have nothing, you can get nothing from. So if you're getting all your diamonds, golds, magnesium, and all this other stuff from African people, then African people must be wealthy. The land, the resources we have is wealth but African people are living in poverty. Therefore, if African people are poverty stricken with this material wealth, then it must be because our consciousness as a people is, imp is impoverished and we are suffering from an impoverishment of our mentality. As we have said before, if you have a good mind, you cannot con another joker out of his land. You cannot con him out of his diamonds and his gold. This is why the other people, this is what the other people have done. They have used their minds and their cleverness to take from us what they did not have originally. Therefore, consciousness is not an abstract concept. It is not just a theoretical concept. It is a concept that is directly re related to the reality that one lives in and to the reality that one experiences. It is directly related to the type of life one will live and does not live. Everything starts in the mind. Everything starts in the mind. How we see ourselves in relation to the rest of the world matters. Individual and collective consciousness matters. Individual and collective self-esteem matters. How I feel about myself, how I relate to myself, how I see myself, how I carry myself, the actions that I have, the environment that I exist in does impact you. And the same for you upon me. We are not independent entities existing like that. We are all interdependent. No matter your race, your gender, your creed, how you know, no matter how you see yourself or describe yourself, you and me and all of us, all human beings and even the animals and all everything that is alive on this earth, we're all independent and in relation to each other. So how we treat our environment, it, it matters. How we treat each other, it matters. How we treat ourselves, it matters. It can either, in one way it matters, it can either put ourselves in the position of power or it can put us in the subordinate position. Dr. Wilson goes on to say, at the bottom of page 94, it goes on to say, ladies and gentlemen, we have, when we behave as adults, we must recognize that our behavior will be visited upon our children and that our children will pay for our misbehavior. Now, in this, he was talking about the children of white people misbehave, uh, the children of white people paying for all of the misbehavior that white people have had the last four or 500 years in America. But that pertains to us as well. The behavior that we have, it will affect the children. And look at the way the youth is behaving now. Look at the way the adults are training the youth to behave now. Look at the consciousness the adults have now. And that consciousness is being transferred into the youth. So that's how you have grown adults who are constantly taping and filming and encouraging their children to curse. Young children are cursing like sailors these days and it's deemed as cute. Hey, I don't care. 
Kids can't cuss around me. I don't care. I don't care that your kids. Your kids can't cuss around me. Keep your keep your cussing, keep your cussing kids away from me. If you ain't no adult, you ain't cussing around me. Keep your cussing kids away from me. And, and keep yourself away from me. Because clearly, clearly, clearly you're not mature enough to be raising kids if you're encouraging them to be cussing. Right? But that's an example of the consciousness being transferred, of failed consciousness being transferred from adults to children. Our reason for being in America is to serve white folk and to generate wealth for them. There has been no change at all in terms of our relationship to these people. And that's our fault. That's our fault that our relationship hasn't changed. Matter of fact, our relationship has deteriorated. We are the lower class laborers now. We are the laborers who are not really needed unless you have some extra special skill set. Other than that, the average black person is not needed by the white people who brought us here to be laborers. Everything has changed. Technology has definitely improved and our position in America has gone from second class citizens to third, almost fourth class citizens. And it is all our fuck because we sat back and expected our oppressors to stop oppressing. How foolish. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not Africans. We are possessed by spirits and demons. We have let another people's spirit take possession of our bodies and take possession of our minds. When we speak, it is not with our African voice. It is with the voice of that demonic presence that uses our lips to speak its own language. Yes, we have to recognize this. We are possessed. If we are to transform ourselves and to transform the nature of our relationship with those who are, who are our masters, we must engage in an exorcism and thus clear the devils out of our minds. We, and that's the, that's the metaphor and example he's used for, the, for white consciousness being transferred into us, but them giving us a slave and a victimized con consciousness. And that consciousness steady being beat into us for over four or 500 years. So therefore our relationship with them will remain a subordinate relationship. We will not truly challenge them for power. So that's what it's all about. Ultimately, white supremacists instilling this subordinate, this slave, this victimized consciousness in us, a consciousness of dependency is so that they can maintain their power and maintain the power structure. And we will not challenge their power or the power structure. So he goes on to talk about demonic possession, specifically in this one, sub subnambulistic possessions, subnambulistic possessions. So at this time, it is worthwhile to read a bit about demonic possessions. It is interesting to look at the literature on possession. We have a couple types of possession. One is called somnambulistic possession. Somnus is the, in the instance of having to do with sleep. You hear it in the brand name Somnex. Ambulistic is to move around, ambulatory. So we're talking about people who are sleepwalking. They're not awake, but they're walking around. The body is moving. It is walking in an organized fashion and walking systematically, but the person is still asleep. In somnambulistic possession, the individual's original self has been represent has been repressed and displaced, and he and he identifies with the spirit that possesses him. His eyes and the spirit's eyes are one and the same. The zombie apocalypse. That's all he's talking about. The, the, the current zombie apocalypse that is happening with mindless people going around possessed by their masters doing the bidding of their masters and destroying themselves and the people around them who look like them so the maintenance of white supremacy can continue. So now he talks about self-hatred as a white defense mechanism. Self-hatred is a personality configuration. It is a form of personality organization. It is an orientation toward the world and toward oneself. Self-hatred then is the white man's greatest protection against being destroyed by the black man. To a good extent, self-hatred is the white man's defense mechanism, the white man's form of self-defense. How can we say that? To a great extent, one function of the personality is to direct energy, 
to direct aggression, to channel aggression, energy, wishes, and impulses in particular directions to organize feelings, to organize energy, to achieve certain ends. Those things that we hate often when we are angry or hostile, we aggress against them. We often attack them. We destroy them. We have a, pro we have a problem then, don't we? Excuse me. He says, we have a problem then, don't we? If we attack things we hate, if we attack the things toward which we hold hostility, when we are overtly frustrated and we are, and when we are angry, then what happens if that thing which we hate is ourselves, then we are hostile, we're angry or violent. We will eliminate ourselves in mass numbers to a great extent. We will hold each other back. The crab in the barrel is supposed to pull the other one down. The consciousness that has been transferred to the crab in the barrel is one of an individual survival rather than group survival because the crab is not in its natural habitat and the consciousness that has been instilled into this crab that's in this barrel is of a new consciousness, the consciousness of its capturer and the capturer wants the crabs to work against each other rather than working together because if the crabs work together, they might be able to uh, put up a good fight to defend themselves rather than just allowing the capturer to boil them and eat them. Think about it. You can then see why the seed of self-hatred is planted in the minds of black men. We spend a lot of time looking at what it does to us, but we've got to look at it from another angle. As I've told you before, every maladaptive characteristic in the black psyche is there for white folk. It's not purely there because you hate you or they misunderstand you or they don't want or they don't know who you are. It has nothing to do with all of that. When you analyze the so-called aberrations in the black personality, you must always ask the questions. What are their social functions and roles? Who benefits from this aberration in the black man's minds? What are the social, political and economic benefits and for whom? Who gains from this particular orientation in our minds? When you begin to see why it's there and what its function is, thus every complaint we have about ourselves has a political, economic, and social intent beneficial to white folk and detrimental to ourselves. They are at the root of all of the craziness that happens. Remember, they promote, they honor, they keep on pushing the stupid, ratchet, destructive culture. They are the ones behind it. They're at the root of it. Sexy red don't exist if the white labels don't push up. Remember that. Are we crazy? We're insane. But they're at the root of it. But it's on us to change our insanity. And because we're not doing that, it is our fault that they continue to reign supreme over us. We have come to identify with them as our natural selves as our natural orientation. We have assumed that they represent who we are and we have now found many ingenious ways to defend the demons that possess us. And ultimately those demons destroy us and have us destroy others like ourselves. And that when it goes to us justifying the debauchery and the craziness and the foolishness that goes into black culture or what is now considered black culture. You are now, it is now considered black culture Rap music is the personification of black culture. Ratchetry is the personification of rap culture. Being hood, being ghetto, being from the slums is the personification of black culture. Black people went from being not a monolith to if you don't represent the hood, you're not black culture. I'm calling out black people on the Shakara Richardson situation. She didn't do, Shakara Richardson didn't do nothing. Black people set Sakara Richardson up. Black people pedestalized her because she represented ratchet culture. And they overlooked and ignored all other black women. And then when she couldn't live up to the hype that they put her up to, they started looking down on her. And they set up for the media to look down on her. Oh, wow. Remember, this was done in the name of the, under the guise of, uh, supporting black women and, and raising up and empowering black women. But remember, they propped up one black woman because she represented the hood, because she had the hood look. They they propped her up because she had look, the hood look 
and ignored every other black woman that she was competing against because they didn't represent the hood. That was the first time I'm seeing it in, in the mainstream that hood black culture is being considered as regular down home black people. This is what black people are. Black people, y'all set Shakara Richardson up. You should be ashamed of yourself because you put her on a pedestal because she had that hood look because she was hood. You put her on a pedestal and ignored and looked down on all the other black women. And then when she didn't succeed, you made it seem like black women wasn't succeeding, forgetting that she lost to black women. Come on, man. Consciousness or lack of. So it talks about lucid possessions. There's another form of possession we call lucid possession. In this case, the person at least has a sense of self and they have the sense that there's another spirit in them and they struggle with that spirit, sometimes losing the battle. They become obsessed in their struggle with the spirit and in a sense are this, this enabled by that struggle. So some of us are in that state where we're not quite satisfied with the identity we have. We know something that we know something that there is a deeper African self in us. We're also aware that there's a Eurocentrality implanted demon within us and we wrestle with that daily. So having the double consciousness, basically lucid possession is the double consciousness W.E.B. the boys were talking about. The black man and the white man competing against each other. Most of the time the white man winning because the black man has to be has to be more empowered, I would say. So talks about spontaneous and artificial possession. There's another type of possession we talk about here, and that is the spontaneous possession, one that has sort of occurred spontaneously against our will. This is in contrast to one we refer to as artificial or deliberately created. What do we what do we mean by that? He goes. When we go into a particular social setting such as a church or a rock concert or the like. We go through a set of rituals and behavior. We go there and go through these behaviors, rituals, songs, and dance as a means of deliberately being possessed by the spirit and having our bodies taken over and being possessed. And then we say we feel the spirit. We feel the spirit living within us. Consequently, much of our life is about provoking through artificial means, spirits, with, spirits which take over us and assume control of our behavior. <clears throat> then he talks about latent possession. When we are possessed and we do not even know we are possessed, this is referred to as latent possession. I think that defines a lot of us. We're not even aware. And those are the hardest ones to break through because they don't sense any kind of split, uh, any kind of split within the personality. They and their possessing spirit are one and the same. When you try to exercise their possessive spirit, they feel as if you are attacking them personally and defending their possess their person. They defend the spirit that possess that possesses them. Let's be a little more concrete. And I want to just give you an example of what I mean by this. In the literature, we talk about these spirits, which are called the incubi and the succubi, a spirit that lies in the body or on the body, the incubus and the one that lies under the spirit, the succubus. When we talk about the spirit and when, when we talk about the spirit that possesses us, when we talk about this spirit that the European implanted in us, in terms of language, in terms of the food, the religion, the values, the social relations, the name, we're talking about we're talking about a spirit that's just not a spookish entity in ourselves. It actually incarnates in us. What do we mean when we talk about incarnation? We are dealing with the Latin root carnis, which has to do with meat, flesh. In other words, the spirit comes to dwell in our very flesh and comes to scope out and to, it comes to scope our very bodies. Therefore, the spirit is a physical thing that as much as it is a psychological thing. The bodies that we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, are bodies that have been created by the European experience and are not our natural bodies as African people. Just as the surface of our bodies reflect the influence of another people, the very internal nature and the psychology of our bodies reflect those people as well. That's why when you get rid of them, you're going to have a healing experience and your whole body will change. He goes on to talk about the multiple personality and enslaved Africans. This is most dramatic 
when we study the so-called multiple personality. Though we have read some of this before, just indulge me again in this context. I'll read you to the description that was printed in the New York Times, it begins. So this part is from the New York Times. When Timmy drinks orange juice, he has no problem, but Timmy is just one of those to a dozen personalities who alternate control over a patient whose multiple personality disorder. And if those other personalities, if those other personalities drink orange juice, the result is a case of hives. What are we saying here? We've got one body, but depending on what consciousness possesses the body, it will react to the drinking of orange juice with or without hives. It will break out in blisters. So this is back to what Dr. Amos Wilson is right. So to drink orange juice when one of when one of the other personalities is possessing it, welts and hives will break out right here. If Timmy comes back, if the new consciousness comes back and takes over that body, the hives will disappear almost on the moment. In other words, then there's a different body for a different consciousness. It goes on to say that medical disorders are found to differ from one sub personality to another. In other words, even though these so-called personalities possess the same so-called body, each personality has a different order of illness associated with it. Each personality is vulnerable to a particular type of ailment, one way or the other. So what are we getting at? We are saying that each consciousness, which is represented by each personality, creates its own body, creates its own psych physiology, and therefore creates its own vulnerability to various ailments and so forth. So whatever personality that you have, as I stated before, whatever consciousness of personality that we are expressing at the moment or is implanted in us, given to us, it will affect our physical bodies. It will affect our environment. It will affect everything about us, inside and out, from the physical to the psychological, to the spiritual, to the emotional, every aspect of our body is affected by the consciousness and the personality that is expressed through the consciousness. As we got the new slave personality, we got new names and we, and we were changed. To a good extent, our names were given to us to designate our new consciousness and our new situation. If you're gonna control the people, you might as well control them totally. Control every aspect of those people. Control their minds and everything else will follow. To a great extent, the personality of the African-American today has been shaped by the desires to escape the memory of the slave experience, to deny its existence. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to come to terms with it. We don't want to re-experience it psychologically. We don't want to know about it. Therefore, our lives become defined by eternal escape and avoidance of reality, history, and of a knowledge of who we are and where we came to be and what, we, and what we are today. Consequently, we cannot act upon the reality of our history and guide our behavior and define it in terms of a fantasy of history and a misrepresentation of reality. Basically, it's getting that trying to separate ourselves from who we truly are is only hindering us. It's not helping us, it's hindering us. If we continue to fight against our own history, like the people who hate slave movies. I mean, hey, whether you like it or not, the slave movies are depicting a real reality of our history. Can't run from it, but we can, we can grow from it. Though. I often ask the question, why is it that the people who pray the most have the larger number of their children in jails of America today? We shout and kick over the benches and so forth yet are filling up prisons, our children killing each other and becoming addicted out here in these streets. There must be a problem here. Ladies and gentlemen, we must reorient ourselves to our religion. We must reorient ourselves to our God, right? To the religion and the God that was given to us by our oppressors. Apparently, we do not have the appropriate orientation because as that book you read says, you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. Therefore, if it bears bitter fruit, or if it bears no fruit at all, the God you worship says, it is but fit to be hewn down and thrown into the flames and consumed. Read your own Bible. It gives you a very practical measure 
as to whether the religion you are pursuing is an appropriate one. That measure exhorts us to look at the fruit that it bears. If the kind of religion and the God you are pursuing end up having your sons in the jails of America and end up maintaining African people in slavery and, so, and servitude in our own lands and everywhere, then something is wrong in terms of how we relate to that religion and that God, since the outcome is wrong and destructive, all because we don't want to confront the abuse that we went through and continue to deal with. Hey, we can either get ourselves right or we can continue being slaves. We can either get our stuff together or we can continue being slaves. We can continue being subordinates to the white men. They gave us these minds, but it's on us to change our minds. Stop being black zombies for white power. We are saying ultimately that the nature of the concept of the consciousness and the nature of the experience of the individual physically transform the brain and physically transform the way the brain operates. Therefore, when we talk about consciousness, we are talking about something that is real. We're talking about something that transforms both the psyche and the body. One of those things you know when the individual is possessed is that the facial muscles change and the body itself changes in a way that it literally incarnates and represents the nature of the spirit possessing the individual. To a good extent, if you are in certain religions, you can tell what particular spirit is possessing the person by the very nature of the behavior that the individual is exhibiting in the very shape of their very physiological body and face. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, once we get rid of the spirits of those demons that the Europeans have implanted in our bodies, our very faces and bodies themselves will be transformed. A lot of the ways we look <clears throat> and a lot of the ways we organize ourselves physically is a result of the type of consciousness we have, which is a foreign consciousness which is a destructive consciousness, which is a subordinate consciousness, which is a slave consciousness, which is a consciousness that has not and is not and will not serve us. So we must change our minds. To uplift ourselves, we must first change our minds. To change our lives, to change our conditions, we must first change our minds. African centered consciousness, personality, and culture as instruments of power. So I read from page 85 to page 111. And I'll pick up next time on page 111 at the second paragraph culture, consciousness, and possession. And I'll read from page 111 to 130. And that will be the last that I will read of this book. So next week's video will be the last video covering African centered consciousness versus the New World Order. Godverism and the Age of Globalism. Great book. I encourage you to get the book. Link is in the description. If you don't have the book, get the book, read it, and you've got some catching up to do. Good book, good book. Change our minds. We will change our lives. I'm Joseph Ward. This is on the shows of Giants. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like, comment, share. Make sure other folk getting in tune to this. Help me get to 50K. We almost at 50K. Help me get to 50K. I need y'all help. I love you all. Make sure you catch the next video.